Chapter 12 of Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosset. Curious Myths of the Middle Ages by Sabine Baring Gould. Chapter 12 The Man in the Moon. From L. Richter. Everyone knows that the moon is inhabited by a man with a bundle of sticks on his back, who has been exiled thither for many centuries, and who is so far off that he is beyond the reach of death. He has once visited this earth, if the nursery rhyme is to be credited, when it asserts that the man in the moon came down too soon and asked his way to Norwich. But whether he ever reached that city, the same authority does not state. The story, as told by nurses, is that this man was found by Moses gathering sticks on a Sabbath, and that for this crime he was doomed to reside in the moon till the end of all things, and they refer to Numbers 15, 32 to 36. Quote, and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him, gathering sticks, brought him unto Moses and Aaron, and unto all the congregation. And they put him in a word, because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp, and stoned him with stones till he died. End of, the quote. of course, in sacred writings there is no allusion to the moon. The German tale is as follows. Ages ago there went one Sunday morning an old man to the wood to hew sticks. He cut a faggot and slung it on a stout staff, cast it over his shoulder, and began to trudge home with his burden. On his way he met a handsome man in Sunday suit, walking towards the church. This man stopped and asked the faggot bearer Do you know that this is Sunday on earth when all must rest from their labours? Sunday on earth or Monday in heaven it is all one to me, laughed the woodcutter. Then bear your bundle forever, answered the stranger, and as you value not Sunday on earth, yours shall be a perpetual moon day in heaven, and you shall stand for eternity in the moon. A warning to all Sabbath breakers. Thereupon the stranger vanished, and the man was caught up with his stock and his faggot into the moon, where he stands yet. The superstition seems to be old in Germany, for the full moon is spoken of as Wedel, or Wedel, a faggot. Tobler relates the story thus An arma maket alawel am santi holz uftlesa. Do hedem der liebe Gott dwalglo, ob er lieber wot ider son verbrenna oder immo verfrura, do will er lieber immo ihi. Drom sid ma no jetz an ma immo inna, wenn zwedel ist. Er hed a pusheli ufem rogga. That is to say, he was given the choice of burning in the sun or of freezing in the moon. He chose the latter, and now at full moon he is to be seen seated with his bundle of faggots on his back. In Schaumburg Lippe the story goes that a man and a woman stand in the moon, the man because he strewed brambles and thorns on the church path so as to hinder people from attending mass on Sunday morning, the woman because she made butter on that day. The man carries his bundle of thorns, the woman her butter tub. A similar tale is told in Swabia and in Marken. Fishhart says that there quote, is to be seen in the moon a mannequin who stole wood, end of the quote, and Pretorius, in his description of the world, that quote, superstitious people assert that the black flecks in the moon are a man who gathered wood on a Sabbath and is therefore turned into stone, end of the quote. The Dutch household myth is that the unhappy man was caught stealing vegetables. Dante calls him Cain. 
Quote, now doth Cain with fork of thorns confine on either hemisphere touching the wave beneath the towers of Seville. Yesternight the moon was round. End of the quote. Hell, Cantica 20. And again, quote, Tell, I pray thee, whence the gloomy spots upon this body which below on earth give rise to talk of Cain in fabling quaint and the quote, Paradise Cantica II. Chaucer, in the Testament of Cressid, adverts to the man in the moon and attributes to him the same idea of theft. Of Lady Cynthia, or the moon, he says, quote, Her jite was grey and full of spotted blake, and on her breast a cholly painted full even, bearing a bush of thornies on his back, which for his theft might climb so near the heaven. End of the quote. Ritson, among his ancient songs, gives one extracted from a manuscript of the time of Edward II on the man in the moon, but in very obscure language. The first verse, altered into more modern orthography, runs as follows, quote, Man in the moon, stand and stood on his bot fork his burden he beareth. It is much wonder that he do not down slid, for doubt lest he fall, he shuddereth and shivereth. When the frost freezes, must chill he bide, the thorns begin his attire so teareth. Ne snow white in the world there what when he sit, ne boated by the hedge what wheat he weareth. End of the quote. Alexander Necham or Nequam, a writer of the twelfth century, in commenting on the dispersed shadows in the moon, thus alludes to the vulgar belief. Quote, non ne novisti quid vulgus vocet rusticum in luna portantem spinas, unde quidam vulgariter loquens ait. Rusticus in luna, quen sarcina deprimit una, monstrater opinas nulli prodesser apinas. End of the quote. Which may be translated thus. Do you know what they call the rustic in the moon, who carries the faggot of sticks? So that one vulgarly speaking says, See the rustic in the moon, how his bundle weighs him down. Thus he sticks the truth reveal, it never profits men to steal. Shakespeare refers to the same individual in his Midsummer Night's Dream. Quince the carpenter giving directions for the performance of the play of Pyramus and Thisbe orders, quote, One must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern, and say he comes in to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. End of the quote. And the enactor of this part says, quote, All I have to say is to tell you that the lantern is the moon. I, the man in the moon, this thorn bush my thorn bush, and this dog my dog. End of the quote. Also Tempest, Act Two, Scene Two. Quote, Hast thou not dropped from heaven? Out of the moon, I do assure thee, I was the man in the moon when time was. I have seen thee in her, and I do adore thee. My mistress showed me thee, and thy dog, and thy bush. End of the, quote. the dog I have myself had pointed out to me by an old Devonshire crone. If popular superstition places a dog in the moon, it puts a lamb in the sun. For in the same county it is said that those who see the sun rise on Easter day may behold in the orb the lamb and flag. I believe this idea of locating animals in the two great luminaries of heaven to be very ancient and to be a relic of a primeval superstition of the Aryan race. There is an ancient pictorial representation of our friend the Sabbath breaker in Giffen Church near Cornway. The roof of the chancel is divided into compartments, in four of which are the evangelistic symbols, rudely yet effectively painted. Besides these symbols is delineated in each compartment an orb of heaven. The sun, the moon, and two stars are placed at the feet of the angel, the bull, the lion, and the eagle. The representation of the moon is as below. In the disc is the conventional man, his bundle of sticks, but without the dog. 
There is also a curious seal appended to a deed preserved in the record office dated the ninth year of Edward III, 1335, bearing the man in the moon as his device. The deed is one of conveyance of a message, barn and four acres of ground in the parish of Kingston on Thames, from Walter de Grindes, clerk to Margaret, his mother. On the seal we see the man carrying his sticks and the moon surrounds him. There are also a couple of stairs added, perhaps to show that he is in the sky. The legend on the seal reads, De Valtere do Cebo Corspinas Febo Gero, which may be translated, I will teach thee, Walter, why I carry thorns in the moon. General superstition, with regard to the spots in the moon, may briefly be summed up thus. A man is located in the moon. He is a thief, or sabbath-breaker. He has a pole over his shoulder from which is suspended a bundle of sticks or thorns. In some places a woman is believed to accompany him, and she has a butter-top with her. In other localities she is replaced by a dog. The belief in the moon man seems to exist among the natives of British Columbia, for I read in one of Mr. Duncan's letters to the Church Missionary Society, quote, one very dark night I was told that there was a moon to see on the beach. On going to see, there was an illuminated disc with the figure of a man upon it. The water was then very low, and one of the conjuring parties had lit up this disc at the water's edge. They had made it of wax with great exactness, and presently it was at full. It was an imposing sight. Nothing could be seen around it, but the Indians suppose that the medicine party are then holding converse with the man and the moon. After a short time, the moon waned away, and the conjuring party returned hooping to their house. End of the quote. Now let us turn to Scandinavian mythology and see what we learn from that source. Mani, the moon, stole two children from their parents and carried them up to heaven. Their names were Huki and Bill. They had been drawing water from the well Birgir in the bucket Soegr, suspended from the pole Simmel, which they bore upon their shoulders. These children, pole and bucket, were placed in heaven, quote, where they could be seen from earth, end of the quote. This refers undoubtedly to the spots in the moon. And so the Swedish peasantry explain these spots to this day as representing a boy and a girl bearing a pail of water between them. Are we not reminded at once of our nursery rhyme? Quote, Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. End of the quote. This verse, which to us seems at first sight nonsense, I have no hesitation in saying has a high antiquity and refers to the Daik Huki and Bill. The names indicate as much. Huki in Norse would be pronounced Yuki, which would readily become Jack, and Bill, for the sake of euphony, and in order to give a female name to one of the children, would become Jill. The fall of Jack and the subsequent fall of Jill simply represent the vanishing of one moon spot after another as the moon wanes. But the old Norse myth had a deeper signification than merely an explanation of the moon spots. Hyuki is derived from the verb yakka, to heap or pile together, to assemble and increase, and bill from bila, to break up or dissolve. Hyuki and bill therefore signify nothing more than the waxing and waning of the moon, and the water they are represented as bearing signifies the fact that the rainfall depends on the phases of the moon. Waxing and waning were individualized, and the meteorological fact of the connection of the rain with the moon was represented by the children as water-bearers. But though Jack and Jill became by degrees dissevered in the popular mind from the moon, the original myth went through a fresh phase and exists still under a new form. The Norse superstition attributed theft to the moon, and the vulgar soon began to believe that the figure they saw in the moon was the thief. The lunar specks certainly may be made to resemble one figure, 
and only a lively imagination can discern too. The girl soon dropped out of popular mythology, the boy oldened into a venerable man, he retained his pole, and the bucket was transformed into the thing he had stolen, sticks or vegetables. The theft was in some places exchanged for Sabbath breaking, especially among those in Protestant countries who were acquainted with the Bible story of the stick gatherer. The Indian superstition is worth examining because of the connection existing between Indian and European mythology on account of our belonging to the same Aryan stock. According to a Buddhist legend, Shakyamuni himself, in one of his earlier stages of existence, was a hare and lived in friendship with a fox and an ape. In order to test the virtue of the Bodhisattva, Indra came to the friends and in the form of an old man asking for food. Hare, ape, and fox went forth in quest of victuals for their guest. The two latter returned from their foraging expedition successful, but the hare had found nothing. Then, rather than that he should treat the old man with inhospitality, the hare had a fire kindled and cast himself into the flames, that he might himself become food for his guest. In reward for this act of self-sacrifice, Indra carried the hare to heaven and placed him in the moon. Here we have an old man and a hare in connection with the lunar planet, just as in Shakespeare we have a faggot bearer and a dog. The fable rests upon the name of the moon in Sanskrit, Kashin, or, quote, that marked with the hare. But whether the belief in the spots taking the shape of a hare gave the name Kashin to the moon, or the lunar name Kashin originated the belief, it is impossible for us to say. Grounded upon this myth is the curious story of the hare and the elephant in the Panchatantra, an ancient collection of Sanskrit fables. It will be found as the first tale in the third book. I have room only for an outline of the story. End of chapter 12 The Man and the Moon